Every day, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, work in some of the world's most extreme and remote environments. Making sure our supplies, equipment, and medical staff are where we need them to be is complex, challenging, and often dangerous. But whether by land, air, or water, we'll find a way to provide emergency medical care where the need is greatest. The helicopter's unique ability to take off and land vertically mean it's often used by MSF to access stranded communities. In 2013, Typhoon Haiyan ripped through the Philippines, destroying everything in its path. Helicopters allowed us to survey the damage and provide medical aid where it was needed. We use cargo planes to quickly carry large payloads of medical supplies and aid to where they're needed, especially in the aftermath of a natural disaster. All goods are pre-cleared through customs, which means supplies can reach emergency zones anywhere in the world within 24 hours. At MSF, we're always looking for ways to innovate and improve the way we work. In Papua New Guinea, we've been using UAVs to travel to isolated villages and collect patient samples, which can then be flown back to test for tuberculosis. We know that the future holds many challenges for people around the world, but we also know what's possible when we go where we're most needed with the materials we need to deliver life-saving medical care. Welcome to everyone and thanks for joining Flight Safety Foundation and our guest panelists for today's webinar. I'm Mark Millam, Vice President of Technical Programs for Flight Safety Foundation and the organizer for today's event. This webinar is the fourth in a series where we discuss the crisis that is impacting the world and the aviation community. Today's focus is on humanitarian efforts. The foundation is proud to host this event and we help we hope it helps us focus on working together towards recovery and continued safe operations. So let me introduce today's moderator, Dr. Hassan Shahidi, President and CEO from the Flight Safety Foundation. Hassan Well, thank you, Mark, and uh, greetings, and welcome to our audience, and a special greeting and welcome to Flight Safety Foundation members around the world. Um, for those that joined our previous webinars, welcome back, and thank you so much for the continued interest um, and uh, the feedback that you're certainly providing to us. We appreciate that. The webinars are available now for viewing on the Foundation uh, YouTube channel, so please go ahead and refer to that and you can see the previous um, webinars. Hope everyone is safe and remains healthy as we try to get through this very difficult period. We can work together and we will prevail and we will get through this. Today, we wanted to highlight what is emerging as a crisis within a crisis, the worldwide humanitarian operations global humanitarian efforts to deliver critical supply of food and medicine and transport essential personnel, including doctors, doctors and nurses, where they are needed depend on safe and secure air transportation. Millions of people depend on this essential air service, especially when roads are impassable or infrastructure is destroyed. COVID-19 pandemic just made these missions much more difficult. We'll hear from the international humanitarian air support organizations on the issues and challenges ahead with the goal of highlighting the kind of help they need to carry out these self selfless missions during the current crisis. So before I introduce our panel uh, this morning, I will ask Mark to give some uh, instructions and notes about the platform and the plan today. Thanks, Hassan. Um, in today's event, we want to encourage your thoughts and questions. 
So please use the question box on your control panel to submit your thoughts, comments, and questions at any time. As we get to the audience questions later in the broadcast, I'll be selecting from those submissions and asking our panelists to respond. And there is a couple of us monitoring the chat panel for other communication on anything that might not be working for you. And we'll assist you as much as possible, but we also devote our efforts to keeping the broadcast on our way with our panelists. Today, uh, in terms of polling, you may want to have a mobile device handy um, or a browser in order to participate in the polls. And when we get to a polling slide, we want you to use that device or a browser window um, and go to a special URL, which we'll share with you. And then you'll be able to reply on your browser or mobile device. And the entire audience will be able to see the instant results on their webinar screen. So just to get that started, we would like to find out a little bit about our audience today. And if you could um, use your browser or mobile device and go to the URL pollev.com slash majorwins156. And it's right up at the top of your webinar screen. Then when you get to that location, you can participate in our poll and answer just exactly where in the world you might be calling from today or connecting from. Uh, we'll just wait just a second to see if everybody gets the hang of it and uh, responds to this. It looks like quite a few uh, are doing that already. And as soon as this stabilizes, We'll move on to another quick poll. For a while there, it looked like there was a big competition between Europe and North America. Um, but let me just lock that. It looks like maybe we've gotten to the point where most people have had a chance to participate. If you missed this one, don't worry, we'll get you in on the next one. Um, so let me lock it and let's move forward. The next poll has to do with what kind of stakeholder you represent. And if you can look through the list of all those possibilities and give us your sense or uh, if you represent more than one stakeholder, feel free to answer more than once. And uh, we'll get a sense of who's on the line and uh, who's joining us today from uh, each of these stakeholder categories. Well, very so good. So that pretty much explains how we're gonna do polls today. Keep that handy. Um, we'll go back to it uh, when we take on some further polls. So uh, back to you, Hassan. Yeah, this is great. Uh, we have a great diversity in terms of regions and stakeholder community, and uh, uh, it, it will be great to get those perspectives in when we get to the audience questions towards the end of the, uh, the session. So at this point, if you could advance to the um, introductory slide on, on panel, I'm going to begin introducing our great panel this morning. I will start out with Michelle Schaffner, Air Operations Lead, International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. Philippe de Saint-Georges, Air Operations, Doctors Without Borders, or they are known internationally as Médecin Sans Frontier, or MSF. Jose Odini, Chief Aviation Safety Unit, World Food Program, United Nations. And Cesar Ario, Country Director of Somalia, World Food Program, United Nations. Welcome panel, great to have you and thank you so much for making time this morning. I know that this is a very, very busy time for you and your organizations. And the fact that you've taken time to spend this, this, this session with us is really greatly appreciated. Um, this is an informal um, 
conversation this morning. We wanted to have two or three rounds of, of conversations around the challenges with the humanitarian effort around the world. Um, we would want to start out with uh, missions of each of the organizations, um, just briefly describing what the missions are. The next, um, we will be talking about the challenges uh, with each of these operations, some of the specific challenges that are being faced. And then finally, we wanna finish up with the future and the way ahead with the resumption of operations. Where do we need to go? What are, what are some of the needs? So with that, uh, what um, I thought we would do, Mark, if we have time, and I think we do, if we could play a clip, um, very short clip, just to set up the um, context for, for the mission. Yep, just getting that going right now. Thank you. Very short clip. Um, it's part of a larger clip that's available on YouTube. If you're interested, please go see that. It's very, very impressive. Um, but with that, if we can come back to, uh, to our uh, introductory slide, Mark, and we can begin our conversation around organization's mission. So uh, perhaps, Philippe, if I can start out with you and uh, uh, you know, begin a conversation around the mission uh, and uh, uh, help us understand the, the overall perspective. Okay, uh, so yes, for uh, greetings to everybody first. Um, I am from the air cell of MSF. Uh, I think that the uh, Quite a lot of you know with MSF, but uh, for the one who doesn't know, uh, we are a medical uh, humanitarian non-governmental uh, organization, mostly dedicated to emergency situation. Uh, we are active in about uh, 70 countries in the world, which means for us more than uh, 11 millions of outpatient uh, consultation. For example, uh, uh, 700, uh, more than 700 patients per year and uh, about uh, 400 uh, birth deliveries. We are about uh, 47, 47,000 people in the world, which means quite a lot of people uh, in a lot of countries. And for that, we need to, in quite a lot of countries, we, we need to move them by plane because roads are not uh, uh, in allow and don't, doesn't allow us to reach the project uh, where we are uh, active. Most of the time we use uh, WFP, for example, or we use uh, ITSE plane, but we have also our own uh, planes uh, on, the, on the field. Uh, to move packs and cargo. Uh, uh, in most of these operations are bush uh, operation. Uh, it's not uh, as uh, uh, using planes in Europe or uh, in US or in uh, Asia. Uh, we have about um, 16 planes operating for MSF and other planes share it with ITRC, that ITRC operate by themselves. We move about 20,000 packs per year and about uh, 1,000 tons per year in this small craft. Uh, it's, it's, cra it's aircraft uh, going from 12 passengers to uh, 38 passengers, something like that. So that's, uh, that's it for MSF. Thank you, Philip. Very impressive. And uh, we will come back um, later on to really um, talk a little bit more about the specifics of these missions and the challenges. But it's quite a territory that's being covered and 
the delivery of, of personnel and, and supplies um, must be very challenging. And um, I think our audience would be very much interested in learning some of the details. At this point, uh, let me um, go to Michelle. Michelle, uh, how are you today? Good to see you and uh, thank you for joining. Uh, let's start with you maybe talking about the mission um, and, uh, and providing us some perspective. Yes, thank you, Hassan. Um, the International Committee of the Red Cross, it has been established in 1863, so we already had more than 150 years of operations. It's a very old humanitarian organization and we operate worldwide. We help uh, mostly in uh, people are in affect by conflict and on the violence and we promote the laws that uh, protects the victims of war. I don't know if you heard about the Geneva Convention or the International Humanitarian Law. That's, that's us. Uh, we are an uh, independent and neutral organization uh, and uh, we are based in Geneva, Switzerland. But we employ about 20,000 uh, people in more than 90 countries. As said, most of these countries where we are operative, I mean, really operational, are uh, countries or regions that are affected by war. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, Yemen, uh, Libya, Afghanistan, Central African Republic, the DRC, Nigeria, uh, and so, so on. Um, we are funded mainly by voluntary donations, um, so international organization, and uh, more, also a big part of our fundings are coming from, from government, but as well from the big um, movement of the National Red Cross and the Red Crescents uh, that you have all over the world. Practically each country has a national society, which is very important to, to cope then with a natural disaster, but as well uh, in case, case of uh, War. So that's um, the brief introduction on the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, I have here just quickly some figures um, uh, that what we do, that's uh, figures of uh, 19, uh, 2019. So um, just have a look. Um, uh, maybe, I don't know if we have um, the next slide. I'm sorry, Michelle, I don't think there is another slide. Um... Okay. Okay. No problem. No problem. I'll uh, talk. Yeah. Yeah. I'll uh, talk on that one. So we we no no it's okay. We we um, transport. I mean, similar to MSF, we transport mainly uh, staff and uh, beneficiaries, uh, people that are affected by by the conflict or by natural disaster. So it can range from patients, uh, people that have been separated from their families, unaccompanied minors. Uh, and then we do also a lot of cargo. As you see, it's uh, in uh, 2019, we uh, transported about 5,000 tons of uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, as similar to WFP and uh, MSF air operations, we are mainly working inside the country. I mean, the last mile where we cannot reach easily uh, the people by road um, or by uh, other normal means, so we have to airlift. We can also airlift um, food and drop it if that would be really the last resort. Um, there was a big operation of airdrops uh, and it's still ongoing in South Sudan. As you can then imagine that today with the pandemic, uh, what this uh, makes us difficulties now to sustain such kind of operations. I mean, we'll talk about this then uh, later on. Mm -hmm. And then maybe for the ones that are interested, as I know it's a group of aviation uh, people uh, listening, we have the types of aircraft that we operating today. I mean, it goes from large freighters like the Ilushin 76 for the dropping as well the C-130 Hercules. But then we have special uh, aircraft for short airfields like the Buffalo, uh, the Twin Otters, uh, the Carans, the Let 410. And then we have the Dash 8s. I mean, all the, the ones that are really strong, rugged uh, aircraft that has to go into these difficult places. Yeah, quite, uh, quite Thank impressive, you. and quite, uh, quite a uh, footprint across the world that you're covering uh, with these critical missions. Um, we'll come back to some of the specifics um, in the next round, but let's move on to the World Food Program, and um, we have both Caesar and, and Jose who will talk to us 
And uh, uh, Caesar, uh, were you going to start out uh, uh, with an introduction, um, or, or Jose, either one of you? Okay, thank you. Yeah, my name is Cesar Arroyo. I'm the country director for the workbook program in Somalia, currently in Mogadishu, beautiful Mogadishu. Uh, the, the workbook program is the headquarters of the workbook programs in Rome. So yes, you imagine how affected we have been because of this COVID-19. Our global presence is in about 83 countries. We have operations in 83 countries, and our mission is that we are the, the frontline organization fighting hunger around the world. The work program is 100% voluntarily funded, 100% voluntarily funded. The, we, start 19, we started in 1962. At the moment, we have about 18,000 colleagues working around the world. Most of them are national staff, localized, working in their own countries, which we are very proud of it. The current number that we have in terms of fighting hunger, we are feeding 80, sorry, 90 million people in these 83 countries. In the context of COVID-19, WFP as the largest humanitarian United Nations organization with a very strong proven expertise in supply chain and logistics, is working closely with the World Health Organization, the UN system, and other ones such as ICRC, MSF, and hundreds of hundreds of, of international NGOs to deliver a global response for the COVID-19. Uh, WFP invests in sustaining its own operations in these 83 countries, but as well as setting up a comprehensive platform of services to enable the health and humanitarian community to deliver support to the most vulnerable population. Existing partnership with both public and private sector will be leveraged and used to complement WFP logistics capabilities, assets, expertise, and services. The three main objectives under this COVID-19 context is to support the health partners and country effort to augment national health systems, enabling access to critical medical supply, including equipment, laboratory, treatment facilities, training. Number two is ensure that those forces behind who rely on the humanitarian community and partner for day-to-day -day support continue to receive the assistance. And I will explain later the example in Somalia. And number three, is the, to ensure the duty of care of WFP staff, as well as the broader humanitarian community, as we need them all to continue providing and enhancing the support. So that is in a nutshell, what the WFP and vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19, what are we doing? Over back to you, Hassan. Thank you, Cesar. And I'm gonna turn to uh, Jose for some additional remarks and um, uh, description of the World Food Program air operations. I know you're dealing with that on a daily basis, so over to you, Jose. Um, we have um, audio. Thank you, Hassan, and thank you for the to the Flight Safety Foundation for organizing this series of seminars, very useful, and for having us here. The Aviation Service is based at WFP Rome headquarters within the Supply Chain Operations Division. The Aviation Service technically and operational oversees a common UN service, the Aviation Field Operations branded as UNHAS, United Nations Humanitarian Air Service. At the same time, Supply Chain Division through its Aviation Service directly manages some of the humanitarian flights like airlines. The Aviation Service headquarters cell is fully engaged, as Cesar mentioned, in the WFP planning and implementation of the global response plan for COVID-19, and at the same time, it continues providing support to the UNHASES in different countries to help sustain the respective operations within the current challenging context of travel restrictions, affecting not only delivery of the service, but also crew rotations and spare parts supply. WFP Aviation has almost 80 aircraft currently contracted in long-term agreements with other significant number, around 50, on ad hoc contracts which are 
preposition and deployed on an as-needed basis, some of them to respond to the COVID-19 situation. The main area of operation being in Africa, there are UNHAS operations from Haiti to Afghanistan. 16 UNHAS operations fly in 21 different countries, providing vital access to the humanitarian community to remote locations and safely operate in conflict areas like Yemen or Libya. Out of the 16 UNHAS, six have been forced to suspend operations and five are limited to cargo only due restrictions imposed by states due COVID-19. WP managed, WP Aviation managed a diverse fleet um, of um, air, uh, aircraft from Airbus A320, Illusion 76 to diverse type of helicopters, which make 25% of the fleet, regional jet and turboprop aircraft to Cessna Caravan C28B. It has transported 400,000 passengers last year and reached more than 300 destinations in 2019 and managed like ICRC specialized operations like food airdrops in South Sudan, more than 600 airdrops last year into more than 50 different drop zones and provide dedicated aircraft services to sister agencies like even the States and UNHCR. The World Food Program Aviation Safety Unit is responsible for the safety assurance of the World Food Program humanitarian flights worldwide. Among other activities, it is engaged in cooperation with humanitarian aviation communities, community and organizations like ICRC, MSF, and other international organizations. The aviation safety unit's areas of work include the registration and monitoring of the level of risk of air operators contracted or to be contracted, the management of the current supporting system, the safety communication system, and the safety promotion system, and to keep up to date the aviation safety policies in WFP. The aviation safety unit is an integral part of the WFP supply chain operations and of the WFP operations system. The regional representation of the safety officers in Rome, Italy, Nairobi, Kenya, Johannesburg, in South Africa, and Georgia in UAE, located in the respective WFP offices, as well as the unit's technical independence with segregated reporting lines enables the WP charter flight to operate within an acceptable level of safety, providing continuous safety monitoring and advice to WP aviation operation both at headquarters and at field level. This is about aviation and aviation safety. Thank you very much, Jose. Very, very, uh, very comprehensive and very impressive. And clearly, um, as you all have talked about each of the missions, it's pretty clear that it's diverse, it's complex, and it's dynamic. And COVID-19 has just made this these missions near, near. I don't want to say near impossible, but very, very challenging. And we like to get into those challenging um, uh, uh, discussions about the challenges. Um, Mark, did we want to do maybe one, one or two surveys at this point, or shall we proceed? Yeah, let's try another poll uh, since the first couple worked out pretty well. Um, so why don't we get uh, if I can, Mark, if I can jump in there, this might be a test for our audience if they've been listening to the missions of each of the organizations. We're going to ask a couple of questions to see if uh, if our audience was uh, paying attention and if they could get some of these uh, answers correct. So let's uh, proceed. Sure. All right. Uh, well, we shared a little bit about where some of these operations are going on. Where do you think some of the humanitarian initiatives are underway? And uh, this is a simple poll to be able to kind of click anywhere on the map. You can do it more than once. Uh, might be kind of interesting in terms of what uh, people picked up as they look through some of the polling that was done. You can see a pretty heavy, con con uh, pretty heavy uh, and dense selection from a lot of the places in Africa. But uh, it's uh, not only that continent. Um, so. Uh, this might just help you in terms of uh, getting used to uh, some of our polling as well. We think it's an interesting tool. And uh, well, maybe just one more, Hassan. Is well, that all right? Before you, go there, before you go there, Mark, let me stop and uh, and and ask our panel: How did our audience do? Did uh, did they uh, do a good job in in representing and and selecting where the these operations are happening around the world? I think so. I think they did a pretty good job uh, in uh, identifying these, these areas. Okay, well, excellent. Let's move on to the next poll, Mark, and uh, 
Okay. Um, in terms of uh, these efforts, um, how many passengers are transported via humanitarian efforts annually? Let us know what you think. Hmm. And Very as good. it stabilizes, I'll lock the poll so we can capture what people thought. Very good. And panel, I think um, this question, uh, you know, is really combined um, hum humanitarian missions. Um, and would would you say um, that it's really that the, the closer to the last uh, uh, item, three hundred thousand plus uh, range? Is that when we combine all the humanitarian missions, yes, this is very important, and this is why this is so educational and important for the audience around the world to know the criticality of these missions and the fact that we're talking about passengers that are being carried and transported in very, very difficult areas, um, as was mentioned, even some areas with conflict. And uh, these are significant operations. This is almost like you know multiple airlines you know uh, uh, carrying passengers and cargo as well so thank you very much for participating in that mark let's go to the this segment on challenges and let me uh, start out with you michelle and maybe you can talk about some of the challenges and we want to uh, make this interactive so you know if you can just share some of the uh, the challenges as you see it from from your perspective yeah, the, as you saw, the numbers of passengers, and there we're talking about the last mile. We're talking about really regional transport of passengers. Of course, um, our staff are traveling, used to travel, if we can say so, by airlines from home to their missions for uh, training, for rest and relief, holidays, a family reunion. And this basically stopped. If you go on a flight, a flight radar over Africa, you will see hardly any plane. There are only a few cargo freighters uh, still flying. So this is the big first challenge is by having so many staff out there, uh, as well international staff, uh, which are away from their families, uh, sometime working in very hard uh, hardship uh, conditions, in security, um, the difficult places as well. Um, so we have to find a way and we're trying hard and trying to as well to collaborate as much as possible amongst us, but also with, for instance, with airlines, with authorities to, to make it happen, uh, to be able to rotate the, the staff in and out. That's the biggest, I would say, challenge today, um, because yes, going from the last mile delivery to replacing airlines, and uh, the second one, it's it's a very it varies. Everybody's, of course, uh, what what what's happening to me if I um, get the flu, if I get sick, or if I have an accident today, um, and I'm in the middle of the jungle, or I'm in a war zone in Yemen, or in uh, or I'm somewhere in Iraq. So how do can how do I get out so we have to also ensure that uh, the medevac capabilities uh, remain intact plus with the issue of uh, the transport of uh, patients that are then infected thank you so much uh, michelle and uh, absolutely th those are um, the challenges that that i hadn't even thought before in terms of some of the requirements uh, especially for the families um, Philippe, um, MSF, very, very challenging, especially when you have to on, on demand deliver uh, supplies as well as medical staff. Uh, talk to us about the challenges that you are seeing. Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, right now, the, the biggest challenge is to, to assure the continuity of service. I think that it's the same case for uh, all the, other, all the other organizations, but we have hospital running and we cannot stop the usual care of these. Uh, and that's it, uh, I would say, the continuity of service is the first concern. Uh, as Michel said, the second also is uh, uh, taking care of all staff, 
because uh, it's a due diligence. We, we, we need to take care of them uh, as uh, they are on the field and we need uh, for sure to uh, think about uh, how we can prevent them from the, from the COVID or even from another accident because right now if something happens to them we are not we are not sure to be able to evacuate them even for a non-COVID problem because uh, with all these restrictions we don't know really how to do it so it's even for normal operation it's a huge challenge besides this this uh, normal challenge we have the COVID emergence in uh, in Africa and uh, we don't know where it will stop uh, we saw that uh, in Europe, in US, it's going very fast and, and big. We expect the same in Africa and uh, in poor countries. And if we cannot move, if we cannot bring stuff there, uh, protection uh, system and things like that there, it will be a nightmare. And um, so that's uh, for us the second challenge. And, uh, the uh, challenge is uh, more specifically on uh, human aviation, how we can organize even our small flight, uh, taking, in, taking into account that we need to protect the crew, that we need to protect the passenger inside the, inside, uh, the aircraft. Uh, how can we elaborate right now correct protocols? Because even for us who are uh, in the medical uh, field, uh, it's very difficult to to elaborate um, uh, operating procedure because okay, COVID is something it, it's something quite new, and uh, this kind of pandemic spread it's uh, completely new. And uh, to organize that and uh, taking care of passenger, uh, patient, and for sure crew with the safety all the safety obligation that we have. It's really a, it's a, it's a big challenge, and right now we have not we have not the good answer. I think that for the moment we are still looking for answer for all these questions. That's my idea. Philip, thank you for that. And you mentioned several times safety, and I do note that all of your operations you have uh, safety standards that are uh, adopted, and you uh, routinely apply those standards to your operations, whether it's aircraft or crew. And I do know that you um, you actually follow those very very um, uh, uh, you know consistently for your operations, and even at that, it it of course is challenging. And so those those standards are very important to continue to have those safe operations. Uh, let me turn to Jose and and Cesar for conversations around the challenges within the World Food Program as you see it. So um, please. Well, the similar. Similar challenges as, as presented by Jill and Philippe. I just want to, in this case, bring it to the field as we are leaving the issues here in, in Somalia today. The, the conflict in Somalia is unfortunately under constant security threat attacks. Al Shabaab and ISIS are here. Al Shabaab is an arm of uh, a branch of Al Qaeda, and unfortunately, daily attacks are the norm. Additionally to that, Somalia itself is affected by climate storms. We have droughts, we have uh, floods, and now, in addition to that, we have the desert locust outbreak in the Horn of Africa, which all together coming to uh, together with with the with the current situation, it's going to be impacting us in May or June. Now COVID nineteen has arrived, and unfortunately, the exponential growth of the virus is now being felt in Somalia. So we expect that the pe the perfect storm is going to happen in May and June here. Now just imagine as the access to everywhere in Somalia is cut because of the war situation, the terrorism, how reliant our projects and the delivery of assets and commodities, health, medical equipment, laboratory tests, swaps, everything 
is in aviation. You see a map there in which you can see the, the World Food Program, uh, the, sorry, the, the UN, the, the UNHAS, the UN Humanitarian Air Service scheduled and routing in Somalia. We, uh, we are in about 12 locations. We have offices everywhere. I'm working with WHO, working with the lo local NGOs, the, the international NGO, the government, the government of Somalia is, is young, but it's really, really uh, growing up. It's, it's really uh, solidifying their, their knowledge as well. We are very happy in working with, with, a, with, a, with a country that is, is really developing. And unfortunately now everything is coming together. So it's a very, very interesting and difficult times that we are we're working. How do, what do we do? We are about 3,000 humanitarian workers here. 70% of them are local responders. And again, we are very proud of having the, the Somali population is so resilient. It's amazingly so resilient. I really love to work with, this, with, the, with the Somali population. They are amazing. Uh, so a very critical component of the response is the coordination and the agility to be able to adapt. Now, as we have the COVID-19 now in town, in the country, now we need to implement as is being implemented in other countries, the physical distance. And for example, when we need to move humanitarian workers within Somalia now, we only can use half of the aircraft to, to make sure that the physical distance is implemented. We need to train the staff on how to do the booking, the checking, the loading, the overloading, and all these locations and the whole situation is start to actually take place right now as we speak. So those are a couple of example, examples. Uh, we, as, as Philippe was noting, we have other emergencies. We have the regular heart attacks, and we have the malaria cases, and we have the appendicitis. But the whole commercial private sector is stopped. That's it. Nobody else is flying here. The only one flying here once in a while is the United Nations Humanitarian Health Service. Now, we cannot take care of 15 million people, right? So we need to, we, it's, it's a very difficult situation in how to work, what to prioritize, what to move. And we need to go to lo remote locations to pick up samples and swaps to be able to then deliver to laboratories. We have now a laboratory in Somalia, but in the, in the beginning of this, we, are we were taking it to another country for testing. So in, in all this, like I was, I was explaining before, we need to keep the, 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 the duty of protecting the humanitarian workers. And what Philippe was, was explaining and, and Michelle was explaining in terms of where do we go? What type of medical evacuation we have? What are we doing for all that? So in that regard, the World Food Program is working with the World Health Organization and other partners to enable the global health and humanitarian response. So we are, as we speak, within the next three, three weeks, establishing specific hubs around the world, particularly in, in Addis Ababa, in which it's gonna be a location with a field hospital, with medical evacuation facilities. We are also establishing globally uh, the, the air cargo and the sea cargo services. We are establishing an international passenger air services with a, a body with aircraft of about 150 to 180 seater aircraft, to be able to transport humanitarian medical staff and rotate it. But as Michel was, was, saying, was saying, this is not a, a situation of just establishing the hub. It's actually the coordination with the countries which will be receiving those rotations. If, if, if a country A is closed and a country B is open, then we cannot do anything about it. So what we are asking is the secretary, our secretary general talking to the different presidents of the world to facilitate the movement of the humanitarian workers, the health workers, the ITRCs, the MSC, the NGOs, every single body to be able to maintain. This is a long, long wrong. This is not a, a, street, a, a good thing. It's not. This is going to take us six months easy. So we are all working on this. And I remember the Ebola time, the solution came after two, three months, the virus was, was in town. So I expect that is not going to be an easy task, but we are working towards that. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Cesar. This is very, very important, uh, what you just talked about, um, the, the, the collaboration and the cooperation that's going to be needed 
by governments um, and facilitating um, and making the missions um, easier uh, as possible, given the situation, it requires international cooperation. And um, we have called out for international cooperation amid this, this crisis. Um, and this, this issue that you are right now outlining really points to, to uh, more of that international cooperation that is so important. So thank you very much for, for highlighting that. I think just I'm mindful of our time and I do want us to um, move on to the future, the next step, and, and uh, where do we go from here? Um, uh, because we do also want to get to audience questions. Uh, Jose, did you want to add quickly anything else um, uh, at this point or should we just uh, go to the future? I, I think uh, you are correct. We should go to the future. Uh, Mark, let's move um, move on because I think this is really what we want to talk about. Maybe I can start out with you, Jose. Did you want to just share some perspectives in terms of uh, next steps and uh, resumption of traffic and, and what are some of the challenges moving forward? Okay, um, so we have uh, previously highlighted the relevance, the, the importance of a good cooperation between organizations. Right? So if you allow me now, after these remarks, I, I, I would like now to get more into safety in COVID-19 times. And uh, I would say that ICAO, IATA, IASA, Play Safety Foundation, and many others have produced very useful information to guide our thinking and risk analysis safety-wise. I would like to especially mention the Play Safety Foundation's pandemic non-medical operational safety aspect, a practical roadmap which discusses safety from the perspective of continued operations, reduction, cessation of operations, and reestablishing operations. And within each of these stages, the paper analyzed diverse factors. I would like to focus on the human factor from the point of view of the humanitarian aviation operations. Humanitarian aviation operations are typically implemented at field or deep field level with specific challenges. These operations entail, and as they are mainly carried out in non controlled space, lacking navigation aids, or taking place in active fight zones while serving most vulnerable commun communities or refugees. Part of it is the pressure of the need to deliver critical services, adding additional stress factors to the crew, maintenance, and operational personnel, as well as to the WFP staff. For this reason, it is of utmost importance to provide the colleagues operating and based in the field with strong support, considering both the WFP staff in the field, the air operators who staff deployed, and eventually other stakeholders staff. For all of them, I would like to express our recognition for keeping up the fight for zero hunger and for trying the best possible to assure the humanitarian colleagues needed access to remote locations in the context of COVID-19 emergency. To continue operations, even reduce, if so is imposed, a lot of additional coordination is required to be in place, sometimes with limited success. Crew rotation or staff rest and recuperation cycles are not possible or are difficult to be implemented. Distance from home and from loved ones, always a factor to consider, now becomes more relevant for the colleagues based in the field in this situation and under current circumstances. It is of absolute importance to keep an open and strong line of communication with field staff and with the deployed team or teams to better understand their needs and support. And we all hope in the future that we will reach a point where operations will normalize. We may initially estimate that a lot of pressure to get up to full speed will be present at this moment. We would be tempted to rapidly catch up with the pending movements and flights. Underlying and temporarily postpone humanitarian needs will, at this stage, gain priority after the health emergency, adding more pressure into the system. This moment will probably find our team somehow tired after so much effort done to keep up operations running as previously described. The air operator themselves may be motivated to rapidly push for normal operations so to economically recover from the previous low activity periods, while the end of flexibilization measures introduced by states during COVID-19 period may find some of the humanitarian crew and the aircraft grounded due to certificate. There are good news. 
Anyway, in this sense, I would like to refer to close my part to IKEA Chief Aviation Medical Section, Dr. Hansa's comments last week. You may remember Hassan during the Flight Safety Foundation's Aviation Medical Community webinar, when she mentioned that we have a system and the capacity to positively handle this situation. While sharing and supporting Dr. Hansa's perspective, I will call the attention to the fact that when fully reinitiating the humanitarian air operations, we may be required to speed up while our teams will be exhausted. The proposal is to use the available system and our capacity and as it was said before, to cooperate, to thoroughly plan for this stage while we continue managing this crisis. So to be well, well prepared when the full restart becomes a reality. Yes. This planning should consider safety in detail and predominantly human factors. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that uh, all the panel today would agree with, with that um, as well. Um, uh, I'm mindful of our time and we did have a bit of a, uh, audio difficulty, but I think we're back on. Uh, Mark, uh, maybe we can go to some questions now. Uh, if we have any audience questions that we want to entertain, I do have a couple of questions myself. But uh, if you're having some questions, please uh, please offer them to our panel. Sure. First of all, to anybody on the panel, how do we manage to do air medical evacuations during this pandemic? As most of us know, the airports have been shut down and most countries do not allow any flights. Philippe, uh, maybe I can ask you to uh, talk about that. It's uh, yes, okay, but it's, uh, it's the biggest challenge uh, we, we face now for our staff huh, everywhere is uh, to find a way to evacuate them. Uh, we are mostly dependent uh, of uh, all the air ambulance services that uh, exist all over the world. It's a dedicated air operation with a dedicated uh, certification. Um, the, the problem, indeed, is that right now, they don't know if they can access the countries. It's a case by case. Each, uh, each medevac should be uh, negotiated uh, at a top level. Uh, to get access to even an international airport. It's, it's uh, that's the first step. It's to get the air ambulance there on an international airport. The second step, it's to move the patient somewhere and where. Uh, uh, that is also the, uh, the problem. Some countries even do, uh, do not accept their own uh, uh, people, their own, uh, and we have to move them somewhere. Um, so I, I think that uh, uh, WFP went with the idea to create a medical hub uh, where to uh, stay with patients uh, while, while we find the way to move them from to back to their country if they accept. Perhaps, uh, perhaps WFP can can explain a little more about uh, this concept of uh, evacuation hub. Sure. Just briefly, uh, so we can get to another question. Uh, this this is something that uh, you you're right. This is done right now on ad hoc basis. However, by positioning a field hospital, let's assume in Addis Ababa, with the agreement of let's assume I'm saying uh, with the agreement of the Ethiopian government, the WFP. It's about finalizing two field hospitals being built. And they are going to be run by either WHO, MSF, or Aligned, right? Uh, and example, Addis Ababa. By having that location, we are not overstressing the local health organization. So the country will the country will be agreeing that the humanitarian community can be. The, the COVID-19 emergencies can be medically evacuated to this field hospital in Addis Ababa. That's an example, an example of how it's going to be working. Uh, again, two, three weeks, please remember Ebola, it took us several months. So we are, we are under the same, under the same conditions. And this is still being coordinated. Again, I have given examples 
have good names to the example get to visualize. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Mark, any um, other questions you have? Yeah, a little bit on technology. Does the panel see unmanned systems becoming part of the response of COVID-19? There are unmanned systems with payloads that go up to 50 kilograms with remote dropping capabilities available to go straight into operation if required. And these can be beyond visual line of sight. Uh, who has had experience in that uh, in your organizations? Probably all of you in, in some fashion. Uh, Michelle, did, did, did you, have you had experience uh, with drone? We following, of course, this uh, very closely. We have a drone project initiatives that we implemented. I have to say today, yes, um, it is limited possibilities due to regulations. Um, uh, most of the countries are not ready, they have not implemented or are not able technically to implement uh, drone traffic into, into the air traffic. Uh, as well, there are some issues of perception because we are working in mostly uh, conflict areas so drones are more seen as a threat rather than bringing aid. So that's also that's something we always are very careful with. But um, I mean, there's hope uh, that uh, it will be uh, very useful in, in the near future and we're working hard on that to introduce uh, drone operations and uh, we'll see what can be done and maybe there's also an opportunity for the future after this uh, pandemic to to use drones for a type of situation like this where you cannot physically i mean as a as a person you are threats to the rest of the population so you you go there with cargo on leave without without pilot Michel, I think the point you raised about regulations is, is so important. As you know, there has been significant activity internationally to develop regulations that will allow these types of operations, and they are occurring in different regions and with different authorities. I think that this crisis actually highlights the, the usefulness of these types of tools, of drones to deliver medicine and needed material and um, be able to, to really be a, used as a tool uh, in these kinds of missions. So I uh, think we want to highlight to, uh, uh, to authorities to accelerate the, the standards on these um, development of, on these, on these uh, drones so we can actually use them more in the field on a routine basis. Um, Mark, did you have another question? Our audience is, is, is staying with us. They're interested. Yeah. Um, we can go a little bit longer if our panel agrees to stay a little bit longer. A few more minutes. I think our audience has a lot of questions, so um, please, Mark. This, this might be with Caesar, because um, he talked about Somalia. Is there a heightened fear of displaced persons crossing the Somalia borders, especially with Kenya and Ethiopia? Those uh, latter two states um, are probably better protected. Could this provo provoke a refugee crisis? Borders have been closed already. The northern part of the Malia border crossing with a both Djibouti and Ethiopia is closed. The border part of Somalia on the Mandera, Mandera part, which is the southeast, and the Kisimayo part, which is the southwest, sorry, the way around, southeast and west, both of them are closed. Uh, they are officially closed. That and that actually keeps uh, keeps it well. It's, it's, it's not a refugee crisis. It's not. It's, it's by no means a refugee crisis. However, the borders are porous here. We don't have the management of borders that we could have it somewhere else. So the actual the actual threat is that those borders are not really closed. And people keep moving from one side to another without being controlled, thus spreading the, the, the community transmission further. That is the actual risk. No, no refugee crisis in that regard. Over. Thank you very much. And uh, panel, thank you so much. I think, you know, just uh, looking at the, at the time, I think we'll bring this very up. Uh, interesting session to, to a close. I, I do want to thank each of you uh, really for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate today. Um, 
very important information, informative, and, and you know, in our uh, webinars, we always get asked for um, to provide the, the slides, and you've provided some very useful slides, so with your permission, we'll provide those to our audience uh, should they ask, uh, because I think it will be really informative to them. Um, I look forward to a day panel that, that we actually can be together and meet in person and uh, and uh, and hopefully um, we will get through this working together and we can prevail. I wish you well um, and I wish you good health. Uh, until we meet, uh, have a great day and to our audience, I would like you to um, stay on for a few more minutes. We have an ending uh, clip that we like to play as we say farewell to our panel. Thank you very much and see you on the next webinar. Maybe just before I play that clip, I can offer that uh, Flight Safety Foundation next week will do a virtual business aviation safety seminar. That is on April 29th and April 30th. We've got four different sessions lined up not all about the uh, crisis, some about the longer term safety issues for business aviation. And then on May 12th, we have uh, the next in our series on the COVID crisis uh, with regulators, both from the US, from Canada, and from the UK. So with that, we'll leave you with this final clip. All passengers, vous avez appelé? You were ready? <laughs> Gentlemen, are we ready? Yes, we are ready. Ah, okay. Yeah. We, we, we can reach really places with this helicopter and uh, give support to staff also to get very uh, urgent cargo when it comes to food uh, assistance. This is a very uh, different job from uh, what you could do elsewhere. I used to work in the uh, commercial airline before joining uh, UNHAS and WFP. Uh, it gives us the same time, uh, the opportunity to work at the desk and in the field, which is a combination that I uh, personally like. The feeling of satisfaction that you're contributing somehow to improve other people's lives to help uh, the most uh, needing uh, people here and elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs>